Lord God, thank you for bringing Pastor Tabor all the way from Tennessee. Lord, we're asking that as we're together during this time, that your spirit would fill this place. Lord, we want to be better disciples. I know my brothers and sisters that are here tonight are here because they want to follow you better. And they want to be leaders and want to know how to disciple other people. So please, use Pastor Tabor. Speak to us through your word and through his thoughts and stories and ideas that we can be um, the best disciples that we can be. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, it is a joy and honor to be here. And uh, thank you, Pastor Ken, for this opportunity to come and, and share with you. Um, yeah, discipleship is what I am really excited about because I do believe it's what Christ has called us all to do. And so there's a little bit of responsibility that I think lays on each one of us. But um, I hope that we don't feel that as a, as a guilt, like, oh, I've got to be a disciple. I hope that we see that as a, a wonderful opportunity. And, and um, we're going to move through the next couple of nights on kind of a progression and build on a couple of things about discipleship. So they will build off each other. So I'm hoping you guys will be able to be here as many nights as possible. Um, but tonight I'm going to want to share a message entitled, a, a Call That Compels. And just imagine Jesus um, walking down the beach. Peter and John are in the boat working. They've been working all day trying to catch some fish and no luck. They cannot catch any fish. They, they've done their, their routine. They were pro professional fishermen right? They knew how to catch fish. That was their occupation. That was their job. And so, but today was not a good day for them. They had not caught a thing. And as Jesus was walking down the beach, these men were rolling in their nets, about to just give up for the day. And Jesus calls for them, go out, cast your nets again. Now, I don't know how Peter and, and John would have taken this, uh, you know, if... Um, if they would have thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm a fisherman. We're fishermen. We know, we know what we're doing here. This, is, this guy's telling us what to do. Someone who's telling them, who's not a professional fisherman, to tell us what to do. So, but they had spent some time with Jesus. So I know in their minds, well, okay, we know who people say this man is. Maybe I'm not really decided in my mind if, if I really believe the Messiah, the Savior. So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to go out again and just cast these nets. And, and, and Jesus again, no, no, not there. Just, just throw them on the other side. Okay. What big difference does it go from one side to the other? But all of a sudden they cast those nets in and, and they sink down to the depths below their boat. And I imagine them even just sitting down in their boats like, yeah, what's going to happen? When all of a sudden the tugging on the net starts happening. Fish. And all of a sudden, it starts pulling so hard, the boat is rocking. They look over, and the nets are just flopping, full of fish. They cannot believe their eyes. And Peter, I imagine, just looking back at the shoreline where Jesus was with a smile on his face, knowing in his mind this was no coincidence. This was a miracle that just happened. This is amazing. And I imagine them pulling up the nets with excitement, trying to get all these fish inside the boat and, and whatever it takes to, to get all the nets in, and them pushing into the shore. And Peter sees Jesus with a smile on his face, just as soon as he could, jumping out of the boat, not caring about getting wet or anything, but running straight to Jesus and falling at the feet of Jesus. And he says these words, I am not worthy, I'm a sinful man. You see, Peter knew at that moment, this is the Son of God. This is the Savior of men. And Jesus looks at him, as Peter then looks up, up, looks up at his eyes and says, you now will become a fisher of men. You now will become a fisher of men. What does that mean? What does that entail? I mean, what type of commitment is this? I don't know if Peter was asking all these questions, but I know if that happened to me today, and if I was honest with myself, I probably would be asking some of these questions. What, what is this? You know, Christ has called each one of us to be disciple makers. And the question goes out, why are so many of us claim to be his followers, reluctant to really commit to be disciples of him. 
Because when we think about it, discipleship is, I mean, it's, it's a big word with a big meaning. There's a lot of responsibility with it and commitment in being a disciple. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer that said, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. That's deep. There's a lot of truth to that as well. It's a life of commitment that constantly challenges each one of us. And perhaps we don't have or we've not had the same experience as Peter, Jesus verbally calling us out to be fishers of men, but we do, I believe, have our own stories, right? Or callings where God has called us from different places to follow Him, right? I think back for me, it was sometime in my college journey. Um, I had grown up in a Seventh-day Adventist family. I, I felt like I was a pretty good person with, with Christ, but for some reason, I, I don't know, I just was kind of here and, and God was here. I mean, we weren't real far apart, but I was not desiring a real close connection. It was just, I wanted to be a good person, but Anyways, I decided to go work at summer camp. Totally out of the blue experience for me. I would worked around my house every summer during um, high school and, and now college. But for some reason, I decided to work at summer camp because as a kid, I went to summer camp. And I had a great time at summer camp. It was a time where we just spent our, our time out in the wilderness with our counselors. And, we, and in the evening, they had these programs about God. And oh, it was just, I wanted to do that. I wanted to have a great experience at camp again, and so I decided to go work at summer camp. And I went there, and I went to a camp in South Carolina, a place where I didn't know but one or two people. I just wanted to kind of get away. And I went there, and I was assigned as a counselor, which I was excited about, but when I started working my first week, I don't know if it was me being the new counselor or what, but I think they gave me the worst group of kids you could ever imagine. I mean, it was just tough to try to figure out how to manage these junior campers as they're running to and fro, and at night when I shut the lights out, they were all talking and up and jumping around. I mean, it was, it was tough. It was frustrating, too. And I remember Friday night that first week, someone came and told me, he said, tomorrow morning, as the sun comes up, we have a Bible study out on the, the dock on the edge of the lake there. Why don't you come and join us? And I said, sure, I need something. I need something. And so we met there early that morning, and we, and we gathered and talked, and I shared a little bit of how my week ago was going. And one of them looked at me and said, why don't you pray? Why don't you pray? And I said, okay. And so there I prayed. I prayed for the, the campers that were about to leave the next day, but I also prayed that God would lead in the, in the journey my rest of my, my summer. Well, that next week, new batch of kids come in and there was one boy that changed my life one boy that I realized when he got there he was he was kind of tough himself and he would often I find him skipping some morning classes and and so forth and he became my little buddy but I quickly found out that this young man had a rough rough childhood even at the age of nine years old mother left father committed suicide. He was left alone. Finally, his grandparents got custody of him. And he was wrestling all these things, and that had just happened previously in his life. But he just kind of talked, and I could tell that he looked up to me, and I just wanted to have a good time, enjoy life. But it's cool because all of a sudden we were starting to talk a little bit about God, and I had never really done that. And what do I say to him? How do I share God with this person? But I knew yeah, this is my responsibility as a Christian. And as a counselor at a Christian camp, I need to do this. And so in my mind, what do I share? I was wrestling. And I remember that Friday evening, the last evening of that week when he was there, him just asking questions about questions. And I couldn't think of many texts because I myself had not spent enough time in God's Word. But I remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. That was a good one to remember. And, and I do believe God gave that to me at that moment as well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And I told him that, and he broke it down. He said, well, I know a text too. And he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he told me John 3, 16, he says, yeah, yeah. But then he started to explain it to me, and it was, it was amazing. As we sat there and talked for a little bit, I said, have you accepted Jesus in your life? 
And I saw at that moment this young kid accept Jesus in his life. And from that experience, I got this burning within my heart to say, this is what it's all about. I don't know if I really did much. Maybe I did. Maybe God put me there at that moment. But at the same time, it's our responsibility as well. That's what being a disciple is about, is to lead people to Jesus. To lead people to to Jesus. That was the moment that kind of clicked in my life where I realized that's what God has called us to do and it started a passion for me to want to continue to share Jesus with others. What about you in your life? You may not have exact the same story as me, but do you have a story? Maybe when, when God placed a burden on your heart for you to do something for Him, it's good to reflect on stories and moments in our life where God shows up and decides to lead you. Because it is when we remember these moments, it's those moments that build strength in our life as we continue on, that we begin to trust Him on a greater level. But if we forget those moments, if we just simply push them aside and kind of wonder, well, was He there? Was this, then all of a sudden, it becomes more of a thing about ourselves then we lose sight of God and become self-dependent. So we need to try to remember these stories where God has led us. There's a text that probably some of us, maybe many of us are familiar with, that tells, says this, Ellen White says in Life Sketches, that we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget his, the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Now usually this, this context of this is talking about our denominational movement, thinking about how, where our church came from, how God has led us as a church. But let's hold on a second and let's apply this to our lives as well. We need to think about where God has led us in our past. And if we think about where God has led us in our past through the journeys and trials and the things that we've gone through, that will indeed give us strength, that will indeed give us hope and encouragement as we move forward to more things in our life. As we talk about discipleship, I know that many of you are eager to probably hear ideas, concepts, what's something new that might be a good strategy for discipleship, and, and we're going to talk about that. But tonight, as we move through tonight, I want tonight to be about you and God. This is where it starts. We need to reflect on our journey with God first and foremost before we say, here's what we need to do with discipleship. Because it starts and ends. Everything is about you and your relationship with God if you are truly a disciple of Christ. So I want you to think about that journey for a moment. I know it might not necessarily be like Peter, but think about the moment when Jesus became real to you. That moment you realized how much you needed God in your life. Think about it. Are there moments, perhaps now, that might be popping in your mind that you're thinking about? If you can't think of a specific moment, then think about, well, think about even this. Go to some moments in your life that perhaps you're not that proud of. Moments when you were kind of here and God was way over here. Or even moments that you were in your own sin, doing things that you know God would not be happy you doing. And it's all right, because each one of us has probably been, been there at different times, and each one of us needs to be broken a time or two. I love that story that Jesus tells, that parable of the tax collector and the Pharisees that walk into the temple and the Pharisee looks at the tax collector, because who are, most people consider tax collectors in those days as what? Yes, they were wealthy, but they, they stole money from others, right? They, they were not honest in their dealings. And, so, and the Pharisee looks at them, the religious person looks at this tax collector and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like this man who, who steals and cheats and does all these things. I give a tenth of what, and he starts listing all these good things that he does. But the the tax collector at that moment realized in his life how much he needed God. And it says that he did not, and Jesus says, he did not even look up to heaven, but he beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. And then Jesus said, okay, guys, who went home justified before God? 
how I realized it was a tax collector. It was a tax collector. It, <coughs> excuse me, those moments when we have been at the, uh, at the bottom, when Jesus comes in our life, we think about those moments and lifts us from the dust while others may be drawing the sins of our life out in the dust. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. Go and leave your life of sin. I'm reminded of the words that Paul wrote in, in Ephesians. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. I also have many of these texts on our screen. But Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to hit a couple of them here. I think even though we have it on the screen, it's always good to look through your Bible. Because when, when you're at home, we don't have screens. And you can say, oh, I looked at that text, and I know about where it is in the Bible, and I've underlined it or whatever else it is. So it's good. Bring your Bibles. Bring paper and pencil also if you want to take some notes on some of these things as well. But uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, we read this. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared us in advance prepared in advance for us to do. I love this text. For we, for it is by grace that we have been saved. Isn't that beautiful? It's not by anything we've done. It is by grace. I love that, God's grace. But what he asks us to do is to have what? Faith. We need to believe. We need to believe that God's word is true. We need to believe in Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what Jesus told Nicodemus, right? Believe the Son of God, and you'll have eternal life. That's what Paul and Silas told the jailer. What must I do to be saved? Believe. Believe. That part that we must do is simply believe. And grace, then, is there for each one of us. But I love this next part. We're saved by grace so that no one can boast. It's not about me. In fact, I think it's about me. I've missed the whole point. It's about what Jesus has done for each one of us. Praise the Lord. So we're saved by grace through faith. And I'm not going to boast about what I've done. No, I'm going to boast about Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus. This is all about Jesus. But then the next verse, there's even a part here where I love this. For we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We were created to do good works. God just didn't create us to be here and roam around. No, there's purpose for our lives, and that is to do good works for God. And I do believe, yes, discipleship is a part of that. It's part of why we're created. Okay, let's move over to another text, which is 2 Corinthians. The next two are in 2 Corinthians, but 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Okay? We're all there now. Okay, this one says this. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am made strong. For when I am weak... For when I'm in those moments where I realize I cannot do this alone, for when I'm in those moments when I just realize it is all because of Christ that I am alive, it is because of that in those moments then all of a sudden I become strong. And that compels me to do great things. It gives me hope. It motivates me. Now flip over a few more pages before to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is exactly what Paul says here. He says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. I love how Paul says this. Christ's love compels us. 
Christ's love for what he's done, even if it was just me, it compels me now to live my life for him. And when I think about this, I, I don't think that I'm much different than Peter or I would have acted that much different than Peter at that moment when he came running out of the boat or running <laughs> through the water and fell at the feet of Jesus and said, go away, I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful man. But God doesn't want those who are perfect. God, because none of us are, but God wants those who are humble. Not necessarily those who are polished or smooth or who have good looks or whatever it is, but God wants those who are broken and those who are weak because when we are weak, it is then that we can, made be, that we can be made strong. Friends, there is something about being in the presence of Jesus that changes us, that compels us. And once we realize this fact, it's like that moment Sign me up, God. I want to do this for you. I want to go in for you. I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. I want to turn to the story found in John now, John chapter 21. It's at the end of the book of John. It's almost the, basically the very last story there. Chapter 15, I mean, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 15. And Jesus had already rose from the tomb and he appeared to the disciples and others for a period over 40 days. But here comes a story again where he's interacting with Peter. John chapter one, 21, verse 15. We read this, 15 through 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. There's a lot here in this story maybe that we could talk about, but it's a very fascinating story, and I believe one that deals with discipleship on great levels. First of all, it's interesting that Jesus asked Peter three times. Three times. Some people suggest that the reason Jesus did that is because he denied Jesus three times. Was that the reason why? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's because Jesus really wanted to know the heart of Peter. Was he really committed to this? But when you look at this story, Jesus asked a question several times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus didn't just start with saying, Peter, I need you to do this. Feed my sheep. No. He asked a question about, do you love him? And that question, I believe, in Peter's mind compelled Peter. Yes, I do love him because Peter knew where he'd been where he'd fallen, how much he needed Jesus. And Jesus responded, feed my sheep. That question compelled him to respond. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now feeding my sheep, what, is, what does that mean? What does it mean to feed? What does this have to do with discipleship? Well, well let me ask this question, why do we eat? Some people may do it to socially, to socialize or whatever else, but the core reason of why we eat is to grow, right? To strengthen our bodies, strengthen our lives. And when Jesus asked Peter to feed his sheep, what did he want him to do? He wanted to help them grow, help them mature, help them to stay healthy. And I believe that is what Christ is asking each one of us. Do you love me? and feed my sheep. Help my people to grow. Help them to become mature as well. Jeff Vander <coughs> Stelt in the book Saturate, which is a book on discipleship, writes this, Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. Jesus was referring to the lost sheep of Israel who needed to be fed like infants the pure milk of the gospel message of God's pursuit and rescue of his people through Jesus. Peter had been with Jesus. 
He had been trained to digest Jesus' teaching and give it out again in the form of eat to digest milk to those who were going to become newborns in their faith. Peter no longer needed someone to feed him milk. He could feed others. Eventually, those he fed would grow up and become able to feed others as well. This is what disciples of Jesus do. They make disciples who can make disciples. You see how this works? Jesus was thinking as he was discipling his disciples, I want to prepare these guys to be leaders so they can disciple other people as well. That they'll be able to feed my sheep. That they'll be able to continue this journey on. I um, <clears throat> moved to Atlanta, Georgia. My first district as a, pa as a pastor. And it was my first nominating committee meeting a few months after I had arrived. So I didn't know everyone too well, but I remember sitting there in the nominating committee and we were talking and one of the men <clears throat> in the meeting asked one of the ladies, so where's your husband been? He hasn't been to church in like a year. New pastor in town, my ears perk up. So I talked to her after the meeting. Can I go visit? Is he open to that? I mean, is, um, yeah, why don't you give him a call? He enjoys playing golf. He's on the golf course a lot, you know, but he just hasn't been in the mood really to go to church. I said, let me, let me try to give him a call. So we gave him, I gave him a call, and I asked one of the elders, would you come with me to go visit someone who already knew him a little bit? Sure, love to do that. So anyways, we went and visited him that, that evening in his house, and it's interesting, and I didn't really know exactly how the conversation was going to go, but we chatted for a little bit, and then I just asked him, I don't know why I was compelled to ask them this, but I asked him directly, how's your spiritual journey right now? And he's like, man, this is a direct question. Um, and he answered, he said, probably not the best. I said, well, we're praying for you, and we'd love to see you back at church. He said, well, I might. I said, things are, are different, we're moving forward. Um, would you be willing to come back to church? He said, yeah, I'll probably try. I didn't know what that meant, but anyways, a couple weeks later, I saw him in church. And when I saw him, I greeted him with a big hug. So glad to see you. And we talked for a little bit after church, and I said, I heard you play golf. Yeah, well, I like golf. I'd love to go play with you sometime. Sure, let's do it. So we made plans and went golfing, and it was so neat because immediately when we started playing golf together, we connected on a great level. This man, probably about 50 years old, had kids at that time um, in high school, just starting high school. But we were just like best friends. He was from Jamaica, had the Jamaican accent, and, and it was just fun to interact with. It just, it, we became very good friends. But I also saw as our conversations continued this spiritual maturity that was coming in his life as well. I think maybe he had just gotten frustrated with some things at church. That's why he wasn't going. But I began to see even some leadership qualities. And so I, so a year passed, nominate committee, he gets elected for some. He's now involved in the church and, and when he gets in that position, all of a sudden he starts doing it and doing great things and just being a true disciple of God. In fact, as I'm at my other church in that district, sometimes I ask him, would you be willing to preach? Oh, I don't preach, Pastor. I don't preach. Come on. We'll work. We'll talk about this, whatever. Anyways, we had several conversations, but he did and did an excellent job for never really having experience. But you could see the passion and fire burning, and we still went golfing. We were basically golfing buddies. Um, then the day came where I got a call. Hard decision but my wife and I made a decision and we moved away, about an hour away. Uh, city of Atlanta, Georgia, that's where we were located. We were on the, east, or the west side and now we go to the east side. So we were relatively close and we still would see each other from time to time. We'd call each other and from time to time we'd meet and play golf in the middle of Atlanta, find a course there in the city that was kind of in between. It was a great relationship that we had. Well, I move again a couple years later, as some pastors do, come up to Collegedale. Tennessee, where I am right now. Two months ago, I got a call from him again. So this relationship now, let me just give you a time frame, it's probably been about eight or nine years. I get a call from him. 
And he said, Pastor, how are you doing? I said, I'm good. And we just get caught up on life for a few moments. He said, Pastor, do you have a few moments? I got a story I got to share with you. I said, yes, please share with me this story. He said, so I'm at the golf course. I said, all right, that's, <laughs> imagine you're at the golf course. He said, I didn't have anybody to play golf with anymore. You've moved away. And so I need to play golf with somebody. And I saw this guy, almost every time I was there, he was there playing golf by himself. And so something in my heart and mind said, let's go up and talk to this guy, see if I can play golf with him. It's better to play golf with someone else than by yourself. So I went up and asked him, do you want to play golf with me? And he said, sure, let's do it. And so we started golfing together. But I tell you what, this man smoked his cigar, and he would smoke me out of that golf cart. This is what he was telling me. He said, I would just have to say, okay, I'll walk beside you. You can drive the car, but I need a little space. I guess they had a good enough relationship where they could joke back and forth. That was the type of personality he was. He could joke with anybody, and it would just go great. Well, they would talk, and pretty soon he said, we started doing this several times each week. We'd play golf, talk. So I invited him to church one day. Why don't you come to church with me? Okay. Well, maybe. He, well, and it took him a while and said, hey, no, I don't, I don't want it. And, and he didn't come to church and, and so forth. And finally one week he was there. My friend was there. And all of a sudden, his golfing buddy shows up at the door. He couldn't believe it because he, he kind of dropped the topic of coming to church. Well, he shows up and, and he sat through the service. And, and his, my friend was eager to find out how his invite was feeling and everything. And he didn't really talk to him, but after the service, the man left, and I said, see, and I, I'm glad you came, and whatever else, the conversation went, and he left. And anyways, they met at the golf course a few days later. And so they're playing, and my friend was eager to find out how he enjoyed church, and so he asked him, he said, did you enjoy church? And the man said, no, I didn't. Well, why? Well, he, well, it really wasn't my style, the older man said. Oh, well, you might come back. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. And so my friend said he was a little bit down, frustrated. And, well, just kind of, kind of gave up a little bit on the issue. But he still played golf with him. Well, all of a sudden, his friend, over time, had been complaining about a pain in his stomach. And he said, "Have you been to the doctor and checked this out?" And he said, "No." He said, "Why not?" Let me call a doctor. Did you, have you called a doctor? No, no, he's not. Do he? So he, he kept putting it off. And my friend said, well, okay, I'm going to call a doctor for you. Can I do that? And I said, okay. So he calls a doctor, and my friend makes the appointment for him. And he said, do you have a way to get down there? And he, never mind. He said, I'll take you down there. So my friend takes him the car or picks him up and takes him to the doctor. And the doctor, while he was there, my friend says, seemed quite concerned. He said, we need to get you some tests. So they went through the tests and so forth. This And anyways, a couple weeks passes by. My friend takes him back to report the, um, the news of, of how the tests went and to reveal the, that and so forth. Come to find out this gentleman had cancer, all spread throughout his stomach. They got in the car and started driving back home, and this man just broke down in tears. I can't believe this. I can't believe it. And just... And my friend was like, do you have family? Do you have friends? What? He, and the man said, no, I don't have family. I don't have friends. I mean, I, I have friends. I don't have family in the area and, and so forth. I don't have anybody really. And, and my friend pulled up to his house, and he walked him. He said, well, I don't want to. It's just in his mind. I didn't want to leave him alone. And he walked him in and made sure he found it. And the man in his tears said, can you spend the night with me? <laughs> and my friend said, oh, all right. And indeed, his, his place run down and smelling like smoke and everything else and he called his wife and said I'm going to stay with this guy tonight I'm just going to sleep on his couch and he's going to this is what he got the news and so forth and so this man he spends the night on this couch and they go back and my, my friend he's telling me he said I start taking the doctor's appointment on a regular basis I tell my church about it and there's this group of people that are going to pray for him Pretty soon, there's several people from the church that are starting to visit as well. The doctor shares the news somewhere in that journey that he only has a couple months to live. There's not much more they can do. He says he remembers one 
evening, he's sitting there talking with his bedside, all of a sudden he breaks down again. And this guy says, I want what you have. I want to know that I can be saved. And my friend there at that moment said, I've never done this before. But I just started talking about Jesus. Just believe in Jesus. Confess your sins to him. And have assurance that you can be saved. And he said right then and there, this man accepted Jesus. He said it was the most beautiful thing. And he said, I don't understand why this all happened. But I firmly believe God was leading me through this whole process. And sure enough, a week or two later, this gentleman dies. Guess where the funeral is held at? My friend's church. They became his friends, his family, especially during those last few moments of his life. He sat there on the phone telling me the story. I'm, I'm kind of tearing up. He's tearing up a little bit as he's telling me, and I'm like, you've got to write this story down. This is like worthy of like a book or something. This is an incredible journey that God has led you on. You cannot forget what has happened. He said, I know, but I, that's why I'm sharing it with you. He said, but I was just thinking about his journey, where it was. And I'm not sharing this to, to boast anything for myself, but for us all to realize the potential of any person out there, no matter where they are in their life, that if they all of a sudden see what God's doing in their life and feel the love for Christ and are compelled to do something, let them do something. Let them find what ministry they want to be in and help them discover God's calling in their life. From where he was, not really involved in church, spiritual life, to how he progressed. And all of a sudden, he led this man to Jesus. And I believe that other man will be in heaven because of his work. How he was used by, by God. Friends, maybe today is the day that we realize God is calling us to be disciples, disciple makers. And that's what I want us to think about this week. We're going to rethink, we're going to rediscover, hopefully, what discipleship is. You know what's interesting about the story that we started with when Jesus called Peter to go back out and throw your nets in again? Jesus told him to go back and throw your nets basically in the same place they had already been. I've already been there. Why am I doing this? Jesus said, do it again. Maybe just do it a little different, the other side of the boat. It's time, maybe throw it a little farther. And when he did that, that's when the miracle happened. Perhaps each one of us has been doing some types of ministries in our life and we're a little burned out. Or we haven't done something in a while and we're here to talk about discipleship again this week. We've heard about go and make disciples, whatever but maybe Christ is calling us to try it again. Do this again. Throw your nets a little deeper because he wants to use you to catch people, someone you never really realized that you could ever catch. God wants to use you in great ways. And I hope as we continue the next several nights and start breaking this down, what is it? How do we do this? And then as leaders and, and so forth, that God reveal to you some simple ways. And really this just starts with relationships, but it really it starts first and foremost is your connection with God. Don't just go out there and try to do something. Start with a close relationship with God because I do believe when that happens, He will lead you. I'm going to end each night with a little challenge. And so here's the challenge for tonight. Something I want you to do, if you want to take even a few moments here, that's fine, or go back to your home and just think about some of these things. But Tonight, I want you to reflect on your journey with God. I shared a story about something that happened to me, about where I felt God led me and I had that passion and so forth because I believe moments when God leads us, when we think about that moment, it compels us to realize He has been leading us all along. We forget those moments and then we're at the crossroads of our life and we're like, what do we do? What do we do? God, are you there? Are you there? But when we remember where He leads us and where we've been, it is then that they give us more strength, hope, and trust in Him as we move forward. And as we move forward in discipleship this week, I want us to have a good foundation, knowing where God has led us. And perhaps He's led us here tonight as we continue this journey. So your challenge tonight is to go home and maybe just 
think for a little bit. Spend some time with God and just jot down a few moments. This is when God showed up big in my life. This is where God came in and, and let this happen. It could be a, 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 a move, maybe back in uh, school at some point, or, or maybe marriage or a job, or, or I don't know. Whatever moment you felt like God showed up big and led you at that moment, write down those moments and then kind of write a few things about how you think God was leading in it. So maybe a bullet, what was that moment, and then how God was leading in that. That's simple to do, Right? Do that tonight, and then as we come back tomorrow, we're going to kind of dig in a little bit more to what discipleship is all about and and what it is. Kind of define that a little bit. Let us pray now as we close. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the stories of Scripture and the calling and commission that you've placed in our hearts about discipleship. Lord, you could have done so much more by yourself. You could be doing this, but for some reason you decided to use us. And as we reflect in our life, and I know I have done this recently, even thinking and preparing for this, where I've been, sometimes even in the deepest and darkest spots, and where your grace found me and and I was compelled at that moment, God, I need you and I love you and I want to do whatever I can for you. Help us to discover that compelling calling that you've given to each one of us because now we want to live for you. We want to jump out of that boat and come running to you and fall at your feet. And you call us to be fishers of men as well. So Lord, as we're here this week, I just pray that you will just continue to work in our hearts and minds. Tonight especially, help us to think about those moments where you showed up big in our lives and started some type of fire, some type of flame that burned in our hearts that made you real for us. Thank you for those moments and let us hold to them that we will have trust and hope as we move forward in the future. So Lord, lead us now. Help us to have a safe, good evening and a safe day tomorrow as we see each other again tomorrow evening. We thank you, Lord, and we ask all these things in your heavenly name. Have a good evening.